Hello everyone, my name is Paul Tavell. Now I've been fascinated by this subject for as long as I can remember, and I've given talks about it for years. I qualified as a librarian, so I know a thing or two about sources for historical material. But for now, let's just get straight into looking at this subject. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, now it's unusual for me to begin by saying that we're going to be disregarding the Bible today as a source of evidence about Jesus. We're not going to be looking at the Bible at all. What we're going to do is we're going to see what evidence can be gathered from sources that are out there outside the Bible for the life of this man, Jesus. We're going to see what else is out there than the Bible. We're going to look at sources that are completely independent of the Bible text. And the first thing to report is that there is a lot of evidence out there. If I was to tell you the number of ancient sources that document the life of Jesus of Nazareth, it would be somewhere between 30, or four, 30 and 40, depending on how you count. If we didn't have the Bible available to us today, if no copies of the Bible text had survived at all, and all we had were these other non-biblical sources, then we would still be able to plot an outline of the life of this man. Here is what we know from non-biblical sources. We know, because we have references to these facts, where Jesus lived, when he lived and when he was crucified. We know that he taught and that he was of considerable influence as a teacher. We know that he performed actions considered to be miraculous. We know that he was executed. Hanging is mentioned as the method which we would today interpret as crucifixion. That he had a brother called James. That people claimed to have seen him alive after his death. We know that he was widely described as the Christ. And we know that he founded a community which continued to grow after he was no longer with them. It has also been said that you could virtually recreate the entire New Testament from quotes of it by other writers. These are all very interesting facts. What we're going to do today is look at these sources in more detail. And we're going to start with some Roman historians who lived around this time or shortly afterwards. We're going to start with Tacitus. Now I've put his credentials there on the left of the screen. We know that he was probably born around 56 AD. We don't know too much about his early life, but we do know that in later life, he rose to be a senator, a council, and a governor of the province of Asia. He was also, of course, a writer. He wrote five histories, including a book called Annals, which concerns the reigns of certain emperors of Rome and was completed around 116 AD. He's known for his very accurate sources, and that makes his work, of course, highly accurate. When any of his writings contain speculation or rumour rather than fact, he points it out to us. He's widely considered to be one of the finest historians of his time. Now, we're interested in book 15 of the Annals, which deals with the reign of Nero and includes the account of a great fire which occurred in July 64 AD in Rome. Nero tried to blame the Christians for this fire, and that was really to divert suspicion away from himself, and he ordered them to be persecuted. That's what we're going to have a look at in this source text now. And just out of interest, you can see the background picture that I'm using today is uh, from Tacitus. You can see the word uh, Christians there um, that's been uh, written into the into the manuscript there. This this obviously dates from a lot later than than Tacitus actually wrote it, uh, probably around a thousand AD. Um, but it's uh, just some evidence before we even begin looking at the text itself that we've got Christians coming into these manuscripts here. So let's have a look at the actual source. Here it is, uh, translated, of course, into English uh, to make it easier for us. So I'll read it out. Consequently, to get rid of the report that the fire was his own doing, Nero fastened the guilt 
and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations, called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate. And a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment, again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome. Accordingly, an arrest was first made of all who pleaded guilty. Then, upon their information, an immense multitude was convicted. Now, this is considered to be the most important reference to Jesus outside of the New Testament. That's the reason we've gone to it first. Clearly, it's not a Christian who's written these words. And you can see that from the language that's been used. We've got a reference to superstition here, uh, a reference to mischief, a reference to evil. These are not words that a Christian writer would have used to describe that movement. But it does show that there was a movement based on this crucified man. It does show that there was an immense multitude, we saw that at the end there, who were willing to die for their beliefs in him. Now Tacitus as a writer had no reason to make up this man. And again, remember what I started with, that point that he is an extremely well-regarded and accurate historian. His sources are, are widely regarded as such by scholars. It's been asserted by some conspiracy theorists that Christus, uh, in the fourth line there, is not really Jesus of Nazareth. And in fact, some of the older manuscripts of the annals have the word Christus instead of Christus. But that isn't in itself a problem. The word Christus just means goody and was used as an early taunt for the Christians anyway. And whatever we call him, he still shows that he's talking about the man from whom the Christian community arose. Overall, there seems no doubt that this is an accurate record of the crucifixion of Jesus. He doesn't tell us everything, of course, but what he does tell us is extremely useful. He is only one writer, however. Let's see some others. We're going to move on to a writer called Celsus. His credentials there on the left. He was a Greek philosopher who worked at the end of the second century. One of his works, which was called Logos Alethes, or The True Word, was actually a vicious attack on Christianity written about 177 AD. Sadly, it's been lost as an independent document, but a man called Origen wrote a reply to it in the third century called Contra Celsum against Celsus. And there's a picture of it on the screen there. And that fortunately quotes almost the whole of the original work. And so because Contra Celsum has survived, we can see what Celsus wrote in the first place. Now, the point of having Celsus as testimony about the existence of Christ is that he shows that by the year 180 AD or thereabouts, there was a well-established community of Christians and a fully developed picture of who this man was, not only among Christians, but among pagans as well. Celsus's writings confirm that he knew about all of these things, the virgin birth, which he attempts to deny in his writing. He knew that Jesus was raised in a rural village in Palestine by a carpenter. He knew that Jesus worked miracles. And of course, he tries to uh, explain them away as being entirely natural. He knew that Jesus had close friends or disciples. Uh, he describes them as 10 or 11 people of notorious character, tax collectors, sailors, fishermen. He knew that they deserted and betrayed him at death. He knew that Jesus was crucified. He knew from his writings that Jesus was a man and not a myth. And what he says shows that he understood Jesus was nothing like the ancient idea of a semi-divine hero who would take vengeance on his enemies and bring calamity on his opponents and be born into the highest levels of society. Those were the things that would define a, a hero in that day and age. And Celsus shows that Jesus doesn't fit any of those 
criteria. That's important because it shows that no one would have invented this picture of Jesus and then tried to claim he was a mythical demigod. And if he really was a myth, then why didn't Kelsus try and use that argument in his work? Instead, we see the opposite. We see Kelsus showing that he believed that Jesus was a real man. We'll move on to another writer. Here is Josephus. He was a man born in about 37 AD in Jerusalem of a priestly family. And he wrote a book on the history of the Jewish people. It was called Antiquities of the Jews, and it was completed about 93 AD. It contains a reference to John the Baptist, to James, the brother of Jesus, and to Jesus himself. Now, his text can be controversial because there is a possibility that some of his texts were edited after he wrote them. But despite that, he is generally considered to be a very reliable historian, and he is definitely not a Christian. So we'll have a look at that. Here is one of the references in his work. He convened a meeting of the Sanhedrin and brought before them a man named James, the brother of Jesus, who was called the Christ and certain others. He accused them of having transgressed the law and delivered them up to be stoned. So, as we've said, that's from Antiquities of the Jews, completed about 93 AD. Now, this passage here, this, this little uh, four line excerpt, occurs in all manuscripts of this text without variation. So it can be considered to be a secure part of the text. There isn't any um, inconsistency in the way this excerpt appears in any of the manuscripts that exist of this work. So all reputable scholars treat this as being a secure, uh, unamended part of the text. And if we just have a look at it, we can see some reasons why we can see this as a genuine uh, piece of writing by Josephus. So it tells us that James was the brother of Jesus, the one called Christ. And the way that's written, it's a very non-committal statement to have been a Christian amendment of the text, isn't it? It's, it's very, um, very impartial. It's not something that a Christian would have written, that this man was called the Christ, uh, uh, rather than simply that's who he was. James was known as James the Just in the early church, and that phrase, the just, was considered to be an essential part of his name. Origen refers to him several times in that way. Now, it's inconceivable that a Christian interpolation of this text would not have inserted the words the just after the name James. Origen points out as well that Josephus is attributing Jewish war as a retribution for the killing of James. That's what this little excerpt is about. You would expect a Christian to have also mentioned the crucifixion of Jesus in that context, but there is no mention of it. So this is not a, a Christian piece of writing. This has not been edited by Christians later on, because those are just some of the changes that they would have surely made if they had wanted to, to turn his text into something that, that proved Christ's existence even more. So we can be certain that this part of the text is genuine and is original. Now, some critics have argued that Josephus doesn't refer to Jesus very much, and therefore he can't have been a real figure. And that's true, he doesn't refer to him very much. But that's because Josephus was more interested in political matters in his day and in the struggle of his people against Rome. He didn't know, of course, what an important figure Jesus would turn out to be. Historians are very selective about what they refer to. Even the Great Fire of Rome, which I mentioned earlier on, you'd expect that to be referred to by many, many writers. It was a huge catastrophe and a very significant event, but references to it are very hard to find. Out of any Roman who lived through it, Pliny the Elder is the only writer to mention the fire. 
So let's be clear about that. This fire destroyed over 70% of the city of Rome and would be far more important to Roman writers than any facts about Jesus. And yet it attracts only two clear references in any writings that we have available and one cryptic one. And as I say, only one of those was by someone who actually lived through the event. So you can't construct an argument from silence concerning Jesus. Just because Josephus doesn't refer to him much doesn't mean that he didn't exist. Here's another example then of Josephus's text. This one is a bit more controversial. So let me explain this. Well, I'll read it first. About this time, there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man. For he was one who wrought surprising feats and was a teacher of such people as accept the truth gladly. He won over many Jews and many of the Greeks. He was the Christ. When Pilate, upon hearing him accused by men of the highest standing among us, had condemned him to be crucified, those who had in the first place come to love him did not give up their affection for him. On the third day, he appeared to them restored to life. Now, you'll notice there that I've put some of those words in italics. And that's to show that there are two layers probably in this piece of writing. There is an original piece of writing by Josephus in there. And then there are what are most likely to be later editions by another writer in there as well. So the original bits are in normal text and the bits that are probably later editions are in italics. You perhaps uh, work that out for yourself. And you can actually see the change in tone between the two authors. You can see the bits that a pagan wouldn't have written, can't you? Uh, the, the more definite statements about he was the Christ and this uh, doubt about whether he was just a man rather than uh, something far greater. And the point about the resurrection at the end there. These are the bits that have probably been added in later. But the Josephus part, the original text, corroborates that Jesus was the martyred leader of the church in Jerusalem and that he was a wise teacher who had established a wide and lasting following despite the fact that he had been crucified by Pilate at the instigation of some of the Jewish leaders. The important thing is that the parts of the text that are perhaps later editions do not invalidate the whole of Josephus's work and do not make it uh, any less than a very valuable piece of evidence for Jesus. The general consensus of scholars is that some version of this text existed in Josephus from the very start. And the modifications would have had to be very early and comprehensive. After all, this appears, this piece of text appears in every manuscript of Josephus. Every single one of them has these alterations in it. So it would have been a very comprehensive piece of uh, work to alter every single one of them. We know that Eusebius quotes the entire modified text in 324 AD, so it must have been before that that it got modified as well. And scholars are fairly unanimous in being certain that the non-italic bits are original and by Josephus himself, and trustworthy. Let's move on to another writer. Here is Pliny the Younger. He was the nephew and adopted son of Pliny the Elder, who himself was a great letter writer in the first century. Pliny the Younger wrote a considerable number of letters himself. In volume 10 of his published letters, there is a letter to Trajan concerning Christians in the province of Bithynia where Pliny was governor at the time. And this letter was written around 111 AD. Let's have a look at it. I have asked them if they are Christians, and if they admit it, I repeat the question a second and third time with warning of the punishment awaiting them. If they persist, I order them to be led away for execution, for whatever the nature of their admission, I am convinced that their stubbornness and unshakable obstinacy ought not to go unpunished. 
They had met regularly before dawn on a fixed day to chant verses alternately amongst themselves in honour of Christ as if to a God, and also to bind themselves by oath, not for any criminal purpose, but to abstain from theft, robbery and adultery. It was all the more necessary to extract the truth by torture from two slave women whom they called deaconesses. So this piece of writing contains the following points. We can see that Christianity was common in the area of Bithynia during Pliny's term of office, and it was throughout the villages and rural areas as well as in the cities. As a result of the phenomenal growth of Christianity, we can see here that the pagan temples had become deserted and the number of sacrifices had reduced so much that the trade in sacrificial animals was suffering. The letter makes that point. He also makes reference to the fact that Christianity was illegal throughout the Roman Empire. The persecution undertaken by Pliny involved the execution of any local who was found to be a Christian and refused to recant. You can see that here. And any Roman citizens who were accused of this crime were sent to Rome for a trial. Many Christians admitted, or Pliny says volunteered, their allegiance to Christ on arrest and refused to recant. These things gave Pliny quite a problem as governor in this area. All of these things from his letter then show that there was a very strong belief here in the death and resurrection of Christ amongst this sizable Bithynian Christian community. To have grown that large, of course, they must have been active for some considerable time. So there must have been people in the middle of the first century AD in Bithynia who believed the gospel and accepted both the existence and the resurrection of the man Jesus. Their faith was based on a complete conviction that these things were real. If Jesus hadn't existed, it would be extremely hard to account for this situation in Bithynia in Pliny's day. Here is Mara Bar Serapion. He was an inhabitant of Samosata, who was captured when Romans invaded his city. Most likely that took place in about 72 AD during the Parthian War. And he wrote a letter which we still have, almost certainly written in that same year of 72. And he wrote this. What advantage did the Athenians gain from putting Socrates to death? Famine and plague came upon them as a judgment for their crime. What advantage did the men of Samos gain from burning Pythagoras? In a moment, their land was covered with sand. What advantage did the Jews gain from executing their wise king? It was just after that their kingdom was abolished. God justly avenged these three wise men. The Athenians died of hunger. The Samians were overwhelmed by the sea. The Jews, ruined and driven from their land, live in complete dispersion. But Socrates did not die for good. He lived on in the teaching of Plato. Pythagoras did not die for good. He lived on in the statute of Hera. Nor did the wise king die for good. He lived on in the teaching which he had given. So again, we know here that this was not a Christian document. No Christian would refer to Jesus in these terms. He's just a wise king, nothing else. Or just that he lived on in his teaching. No mention at all of the resurrection there, is there? So this is clearly a pagan reference to him. This is someone who, who doesn't follow that movement of Christianity. But it's very interesting the way this is written because he refers to two other people who are real historical figures, Socrates and Pythagoras. And he puts Jesus alongside them to make a trio of historical figures. Socrates and Pythagoras were well-known people. They were very much in the consciousness of people at the time. And it seems that Jesus fulfills a similar role here. It would be odd if he had picked a fictional third person to make his point in this letter. So let's move on from him into a 
an historian come astronomer uh, by the name of Thallus, who wrote in the first century AD, possibly around 52 AD. The works of Thallus are now lost, but they are referenced by other writers. Uh, one in particular is in Africanus's third century work called Chronography. We know that Thallus wrote a history of the Eastern Mediterranean world in 52 AD, so about 20 years or so after the crucifixion of Christ. He referred to the darkness at the time of the crucifixion, which is mentioned in the Gospels, and he explains it away as an eclipse of the sun. So I can put on the screen for you the writings of Julius Africanus in the third century, who refers to Thallus's work. Thallus, in the third volume of his histories, explains this darkness as an eclipse of the sun, unreasonably, as it seems to me, and it was at the season of the paschal full moon that Christ died. So this is a reference then to the fact that Jesus was crucified at the Passover, which always occurs at a full moon. So that explains his reference. But this does corroborate the idea that there was darkness in all the land at the time of the death of Christ, something that we find in the gospel records. And as I've said before, just remember, these are not Christian writers. Thallus is no different here. They have no reason for contributing to a legend about him. They're, they're just trying to write their history. And we have another astronomer next. This is the seventh out of eight. So we're nearly, nearly done with the ones I wanted to show you today. But number seven is Phlegon, uh, another astronomer who was writing around 120 AD. His works again have been lost, but they are quoted by other writers like Origen and Africanus. Now, thinking about that darkness that we've just seen with Thallus, Phlegon, a Greek, wrote a history around 137 AD and reported the following. He said in the fourth year of the 202nd Olympiad, which corresponds to roughly AD 33, there was the greatest eclipse of the sun and then it became night in the sixth hour of the day. That's noon. So that stars even appeared in the heavens. There was a great earthquake in Bithynia and many things were overturned in Nicaea. Phlegon has been informed by other accounts, but look, isn't it interesting? They come from other cities. This was clearly a huge event. He's reporting what was seen in Bithynia and what was what happened in Nicaea, as well as what was seen more locally. This was a huge event that was visible from large swathes of the eastern Mediterranean. And the reports agree with each other. There was a, a huge darkness. There was a great earthquake. These are things that again corroborate what we would read in the gospel accounts. So Phlegon's testimony adds a further voice to the weight of non-biblical evidence for this great unexpected darkness at the time of the crucifixion. Darkness that happened right in the middle of the day. Now I wanted to put a, a slide up about Christian writers as well. So these are not biblical works, but they're writings from Christians. Uh, and these are very valuable because these are those who knew the disciples personally. So just to briefly go through uh, three of them. There was Clement of Rome, whose picture is on the screen there. He wrote a letter in about 96 AD to give a judgment about a problem in Corinth, which was about different Christian factions and which itself makes several quotations from the New Testament. Clement clearly believed that Jesus was a real person, and hence any idea that he was a myth created around the time of Constantine in the fourth century is clearly impossible. Polycarp, who was Bishop of Smyrna, was born around 69 AD and met the Apostle John in his later years. He wrote a letter around 115 AD, which refers to Jesus, and quotes from the Gospels. Again, he can't have been a myth made up 200 years later. And then there was Ignatius, Bishop of Antioch in Syria, born about 35 AD and martyred 
some point before 117, perhaps around 108 AD. He wrote in a letter on his way to being executed that Jesus was truly persecuted under Pilate, was truly crucified, was truly raised from the dead, and that those who believe in him would be raised too. Let's have a look at this letter. Stop your ears, therefore, when anyone speaks to you at variance with Jesus Christ, who was descended from David and was also of Mary, who was truly born and did eat and drink. He was truly persecuted under Pontius Pilate. He was truly crucified and died in the sight of beings in heaven and on earth and under the earth. He was also truly raised from the dead, his father having raised him up, as in the same manner his father will raise up us who believe in him by Christ Jesus apart from whom we do not possess the true life. So his letter, again, backs up the idea that he believed that Jesus was a real person. And of course, this is someone who lived most of his life in the first century. So just remember, these writers here would have known people who had been with Jesus, who had witnessed his work, and who had maybe even seen his death. Their testimony is important evidence too. In all of this, we know of no disciple who under torture admitted that it was all made up. And the key point here is that people don't die for a lie. But they were willing to die for something they had seen with their own eyes and touched with their own hands. And what we've looked at amounts to a significant body of evidence in the first and second centuries AD that hinges on the fact that Jesus was a real person. And the movement he inspired must have been based on that very fact. It corroborates for us a whole series of facts which amount to a real historical person who can't be swept away as a myth. We've gone over most of these points in those slides that we've seen today. As I've put up there, there are more that we haven't looked at. So this is far more evidence for this man than there is for many other ancient figures who are commonly taken to be historical, such as Pontius Pilate, such as Nero, such as Socrates, such as Hannibal. The idea that this was all a fourth century fabrication is nonsensical in the face of these facts. These texts were written by a wide range of different authors. They had no reason to invent a Messiah myth. We can't ignore their work. Well, I hope you've enjoyed watching this presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. And I hope you enjoy the rest of this series as well. Mm -hmm.